have you come across stories of school dropouts who worked so hard to later end up educating other people? That's always a fascinating story. Hello and a very warm welcome to The Real Talk. How was your week? We're happy to have you here with us and we are coming to you from Mythos Boutique Hotel in Kiovu. I hope you have found time to check them out at Atmosphere Restaurant. And people wonder why do you talk about food so much? <laughs> I say because I love food. And so yes, please visit Atmosphere Restaurant at the Mythos Boutique and try out their new menu. Uh, tonight we're talking to a young man. My goodness, on this show I've had very young people. Like I have been challenged the last episodes of The Real Talk have brought me in contact with a lot of young people, people who are doing such great work in their 20s. Today, our guest is the founder and CEO of Deuce Leadership Initiative, and that's Shalene Prezen Chikomo. We're happy to have you here, Shalene. Thank you very much for having me. It is a pleasure to see you. Shalene, there's a fascination among young people to give themselves big titles like founder and CEO. <laughs> so I'm hoping that you're not a founder and CEO of a briefcase organization <laughs> that will not be here in the next two years. I really know. I think it has been there for five years. Oh, wonderful. And I think that alone is a proof. I think we are on something real. Okay. Uh, and that's why we are on the real talk. <laughs> you're right. Wonderful. But do you agree with me that there's this whole thing of young people wanting to show that they are successful, they're making it big, and so they want to compete for titles with people senior than them? I totally agree with you. In okay. fact, uh, I think last week by Tuan, I actually come across an article which was called The Silicon Vision of Success, where everybody thinks of, I just want to be a founder. I just want uh -huh. to start something and all of that. But I think yeah. we need to reach a point where we actually redefine what success is all about. Yes. Sometimes it's not about starting organizations. It's about making other people happy. It's about uplifting other people to get a better sense of themselves. And it's about just making the already existing things efficient. So right. I totally agree with you. And I think something has to be done. So Shalene, you're a young man who wears, and by young, this young man is 24 years old. So <laughs> indeed, very young. You wear many hearts and you, you, one of those is <laughs> your description of yourself yeah. as a school dropout. Yeah. If you can talk to us about that phase of your life. Yeah, I, I actually love talking about that because that's what informs everything that I do. So if you look at my name, Shalene, it is a lady's name. And most of the time when people ask my name and I tell them, my name is Shalene, they tell me that it's a girl's name. And they are right. This is a name of a British lady who sent me to grade one in 2005 because I was living in a poor family that could not afford the Zimbabwean education. So she sent me from grade one to grade three. And when I was supposed to, grade, to go to grade four, she left Zimbabwe. And I also left school from 2007 to 2010. So this was a period of you know, mockery. This was a period of deprivation. This was a period of, you know, being looked down upon. In fact, in Zimbabwe, they sing a song for you if you're not going to school. And I put it in Shona and interpret it for the audience. Mm -hmm. They say, Mavudzi Sengundu Chafa Wagadero Snamboziza. Now, what this means is your hair looks like that of an African traditional healer. You will die like that without an education. And, you know, living through that and going through that made me actually lose everything about me, feeling like I'm not a candidate for success. Maybe success was for other people. But in 2020... But you're also very young. Exactly. How old were you then? Um, I, you I think I, because that was, I think I was around eight there. And, you know, when people are laughing, it wasn't making that much of a sense to me because I didn't also understand yes, the essence I, I of education. you don't understand this well. But in 2010, I was lucky mm. enough to find well-wishers who were willing to send me back to school. So I went to grade seven in the village and I got 14 units. So when you get 14 units in Zimbabwe, it's like you have not failed, you have also not passed, you are in between. And then they were like, let's send this child to the urban area for the first time. Because if you could get 14 units after missing school like this, I would think there's a potential. So now I'm in the city now. The life of the city started. And I could not relate with most of the kids because they would talk about games like Mortal Kombat. They would talk about Lionel Messi, the Ronaldos. They would talk about presidents and all that. And I'm talking about the baboons, you know. Talk about TV programs uh, yes. that you don't have a TV. I, I don't have a TV. Uh, thank God now I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, they, they are talking about all these things. But fortunately, I had teachers who were really able to support me. 
And they started calling me Mr. President. They started calling me a leader. Wow. And for some wow. reason, I got inspired. Um, and I, I worked so hard. And in 2015, I was also lucky enough to be selected in the Zimbabwean Junior Parliament, where I served. And now I could meet with these leaders, you know, the, the President Mugabe's, the president who is now the president was a minister then. I could meet with them and get to inspire, just realizing these are also people like us. There's something about their life that they are doing that I can also do and one day would be a leader. So when I wrote my O-level exam, I was, I was exam I was able to get seven A's. And, when I re and they were like, what do you want to do? And I was like, I think I want to be a policeman. And they were like, how do you want to be a policeman in seven A's? You need five C's to be that. And I was like, you know what? Growing up, I've seen how our mothers were being abused. And I just feel like I want to be an agent of the law and make sure there's nobody who's going to uh, disrespect women in this country. They were like, but you can become a lawyer. How about you go to A level and study humanities? So in Zimbabwe, to, to become a lawyer, you need to study three humanity subjects and get straight A's, which is 15. They were like, go and do four. We believe you can get 20 points and get a scholarship. So I went there. And by the grace of God, I got 20 points as one of the top performing students in the country. So all, what I can just say from all this is every time I was in class, I was always asking myself one question. What is the connection between what I'm learning in class and the challenges of the community I've spent most of my time as a dropout? Um, what is it about their children who are not going to school that is also special probably that other people don't know. And what is it about those that are in school? And how, how can we teach empathy to the students that are in school that they won't just sing these songs to these kids, but see themselves as a beacons of light to actually inspire others to also be educated even without coming to class. And see themselves as a privileged lot. That's very So you true. asked yourself about the connection. Did you find the connection? So by the time I asked, that was in 2017, I realized that in class, I was learning to get a certificate. But in the community, it was more about the skill. The certificate was like an icing on a cake. You know, you don't eat an, an icing unless you want to get sick. You have to mix it with bread. And for me, the bread was the skill. But I could see a lot of my guys in class were not interested much in the skill. The interest was in getting the certificate. But in the community I'd spend most of my time in, it was about, can you farm? Can you look after the cattle? Can you look after your siblings? It was more, can you communicate in a way that can make people rally behind what you're talking about? Can you influence? It was more about the skill than it was more about certificate. And I realized that in class, it was more about when I finish, I'm going to get a job. It was because in class, I'll just cut you short, yeah. Shaleen, because yeah. indeed, and for most of Africa, yeah. our education curriculum is such that in class, mm -hmm. we're always reading yeah. to pass an exam, yeah. qualify to go to the next stage. Yeah. So you're in nursery, yeah. you're then studying to go to primary. Yeah. After primary, there's secondary. Yeah. We're always reading towards Finishing one stage, going yeah. to the next, getting yeah. that certificate, yeah. and going to the next. So indeed, yeah. it's just about reading, cramming, sitting the exams, passing off Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's like we are being educated to be different from our people that we should save. And I would realize that people are saying, when I finish, I'm going to get a job. And I'm looking at the community I was in, mm -hmm. and I'm like, the jobs are not as much available as these people are talking about. We might need other people who think differently to say, I'm not just looking, but maybe I need to start creating an opportunity. And you know, I would sit in class and see, we didn't even like each other. It was a competition. I want to be the best. Yes, I don't I care. Be number one. If it means copying for me to get that A, I'll do it. I don't care about what other people think. And I realized that it's so much of what we know than who we know and who knows us. Yet, we don't succeed because of what we dream of. We succeed because of the teams we build over time. And I was like, this is a gap, actually. And maybe what we need is somebody who is going to lead a movement of young people to start helping them to bridge the gap between the school and the marketplace. And that's what informs most of the things I do. Jay. So this sort of thinking, did it interfere with your performance in school? Because I imagine mm -hmm. if you're sitting an mm -hmm. exam, mm -hmm. but you're already looking at it from a negative yeah. point, mm -hmm. then you will not pass. Uh -huh. So did that thinking, because you sound like you were quite disturbed yeah. at that time, yeah. did it affect your performance? Actually, I think it has helped. Because I am not against school but I'm looking for better ways it can be efficient. So when I was in class, for example, I realized that if I was going to talk about this without having all the A's, I'm going to be called a failure who is trying to resurrect himself. It's a bitter guy. A bitter guy, you know, yeah. he doesn't know these things. So that's why he's talking about it. So the fact that I actually got all the A's at advanced level, I'm one of the top performing students. It means that I wasn't against it, but I'm saying there is more to life than a certificate. 
there is more to life than being in class. So for me, it has actually helped me. Helped me in what way? If you are a student and you study with a vision, you are probably going to be the best student in class because then you don't need the teacher to remind you to read. You don't need somebody to push you. You have a push as a vision that was pushing me. And also, I wanted to be an example of even this system I'm talking about that I've gone through it and this is what I've achieved, but I think it can be better than allowing a failure to talk about it because you're not the head, mm -hmm. you know. So it helped me, if I can say so. What is the role of a parent or a guardian in this? Because again, mm -hmm. majority of the African children that go to school yeah. are pushed by their parents. True. When you say as a child, if you go to school with a vision, mm -hmm. rarely do we go with a vision. Yeah, true. In most cases, it's our parents' vision. Yeah. Your father is a doctor, and so they want you to study medicine. Yeah. Oh, you're telling your father, I'm passionate about music. They're saying, no, mm -hmm. there is no money in yeah. music. Mm -hmm. So what then should parents and guardians do mm -hmm. in shaping this child mm -hmm. from that level? I think parents should, first of all, understand that their kids are not empty buckets that needs to be filled. They are fires that needs to be ignited. Every time you find yourself with a child, it is a blessing that you have been given to nature to discover, develop, and deploy. So more than we just impose our thinking, impose what we think should be done, we should also actually be able to deploy ourselves into unleashing that which our children have. And in education, we actually talk about that a lot when we say education comes from two Latin words, which is educere and educare. And to educere means to bring out the inner demons of the person, and to educare means to mold them. And I just think if our parents could understand that, it is not just about what you want, but it is also about that which is inside of the student. And have that meaningful observation of what your child is good at, that meaningful conversation with the people who interact with your child on a daily basis. Because I remember, for example, my father would come and probably once and give us money and then go. And he thought he was a good father because we had money. money yeah. But fatherhood is not just about money. There was more to that. Right? The word father actually comes from a Greek word, pater. It means the originator. There is a duty of the father in discovering that which is inside of me. But for him, he thought money was everything. And because, you know... So your father did not, was not very present in e your life. Exactly, exactly, you know. But uh, I don't blame him. I think he was thinking he was doing very good thing according to the culture and according to everything. But it's only now that as I stand here, I'm like... There's more parents could do in terms of discovering, developing, and deploying what is inside of their children. Because wow. the world has nothing for them or to them. It is everything through them. The inner diamonds that lies inside our children is the world that they are looking for. And as a parent, if you can start that, teachers have no choice than to follow. Students spend very limited time at school mm -hmm. and more time at home. So home is actually the biggest school an African child has. And if you don't educate at home, don't expect that school to do what we don't do as parents. Yeah. From your experience as an African child who's been able to travel around other African homes, yeah. do you feel like our African parents fund the fire or do they uh, put it off? I, I, it's a hard question to answer. I don't want to sound <laughs> disrespectful, but I would say the truth. I feel like for now, if we are fanning the fire, we are not fanning enough. I think more could be done in terms of Let's take, for example, in how many African homes do we get to see our parents before they send us to school asking, what do you want to do? You know, for me, what I've seen most is do this because there's a child there. For example, in Zimbabwe, you know, if there is a doctor in, 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 in your village, yeah. all of you have to be doctors because why? They have seen him driving a car they did not drive. Uh -huh. They have seen him wearing a, a, a dress or a suit they couldn't. That the other homes don't have. So for so me, I was like... pointing at that person. Exactly. Mm. So the definition of societal success itself is, 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 is not defined well because they think driving a car, owning a... You see, have you ever seen that success in Africa is... I, I, I want to say this to you, Jackie. Have you ever realized that in Africa it's... When I grow up, I want to get a job, I get a house, I get a car, I get married. Where is the Elon Musk are like... I want to go to Mars. <laughs> we don't have that. The Zuka are like, I want to start Facebook and the whole world will use it. That was the understanding yeah. of success. That's what, and, and I can actually add something to what you're saying. You know, for example, when I was in the village, we, the, the, the biggest people we, would see, we could see is like a soldier because there's usually violence and there is need for peace a policeman, because there's somebody who's beating his wife somewhere and there's need for the police. Then an there's, agriculture, a uh, there's a nurse, because there are those who are sick. That's all. So we grew up, all of us, even me, you see, when I went to Eben, I was like, I want to be a policeman. Mm. 
-hmm. Until there is this guy in Mashingo where I was. So what he used to do, they used to take me in the morning and go with me to town. And then we would use an elevator to go up. And then they just knock into a certain office and say, hi, tell us what you do. You know, this is my kid. Just tell him. And then they tell me, you know, I do this and this and this. Tomorrow, he takes me to a very furnished neighborhood. So we'd go, let's say, to one of these, you know, fancy, fancy neighborhoods. And he leaves me there at 6 and comes and takes me around 3 to play with the kids of the rich and also understand there's more we don't know. And in those days, I didn't appreciate it. But now mm. I'm seeing how it shaped me in terms of exposure and, and exposure. in terms of inspiration. Yeah. yeah, you know, and sometimes, you know, for example, kids who are in the, in the cities, they don't realize these things. Just to be surrounded by the president's offices in Kigali, all these offices, all these lawyers, all these agricultural experts are in the capital city. And you don't realize how much of a privilege it is to have to the JKs who are the journalists, you are yeah. there. It, at least it's a child and in the city. And you have a conversation. A conversation. At your age, I would never access a TV person. Oh, where would I see that? You see? You're where, in the village. Where, where? would you even get You don't even yet? know. So your, your, lim your career choices are very limited. Mm -hmm. But because of this exposure, you know you can be anything because you have those people to inspire you at the point of just a click and you are with them. Should this exposure be both ways? Because, again, mm -hmm. there's always that desire to mm -hmm. have our children in the rural area uh -huh. exposed to the urban way of yeah. living. Yeah. But now we find ourselves in a place where a lot of our all of the current parents are giving birth in the cities mm -hmm. and confining their children in the cities and not ever thinking mm -hmm. of exposing them True. to what happens in True. the village. True. Does that have an effect on the African it, concept? It, it, it actually has, because exposure has always been a village kid coming to town. That's the thing, <laughs> automatically. <laughs> nobody views, never be, nobody yes. views the, yeah. the vice versa yeah. as exposure. But, no. but actually, it's vice versa. Okay. And, and, and for me, it's even, it's even big now. Because, for example, when I founded Juice Leadership Initiative, I'll give you one experience. And we, we've not even talked about that. We will get there. We will get there because I want we'll to know what there. inspired you. Exactly. To mm. when, I, when, I, when I founded Juice Leadership Initiative, I remember one day we went to look for funding. So we were sleeping in a hotel ready to pitch our ideas tomorrow. Yeah. And here comes this, this guy. He was from Kenya and from the city. And he says to me, man, are you ready? Let's do some rehearsals together to get to see if we can give each other feedback. I said, sure, start. And then he started, he said some terms and some things I was not aware of. And then it's, it's now my turn. And I talked about the problem I've seen and how I want to solve it in a very simple way. And the guy was like, do you know something called business model? Do you know something like breaking the market? Do you know something? And I didn't know. And I was demotivated. Yeah. But something in me, the words of my grandmother came. My grandmother told me that in every room you enter, don't let the room influence you, influence the room. You have something they don't, don't go to America and sing hip hop. They already have enough of it. Go and do the Rwandan traditional dance. It's not there and it's uh -huh. unique, it will sell you out. So I went there and I, I, I went for the pitching. Surprisingly, I won. Why? Yeah. Because I had a better understanding and exposure of the problem I was talking about. This so, other guy just had big words. Big words and, you know, town life and all these things. Yeah. So I also want to actually let to tell parents that it also means taking those that are in the towns and expose them to the village. Yes. Because there they will actually get to see the gravity and the intensity of the challenges they are trying to solve. One, two, empathy. They, uh, one day I was talking at a school here. It's, it's at Riviera. And I was, t I, was, I was talking to the students there and I was telling them, do you guys sometimes just close your eyes and ask yourself how many kids wanted to be here but they are not here? Do you guys just close your eyes and ask yourself how many kids don't eat the way you're eating three meals, the uniform you are wearing? How many kids want to be at a boarding school but they can't? Do you think about that for a moment? Mm. Many of them were crying. But this is just me asking. They haven't seen it. Yeah. Imagine if you make them see it. Yeah. They, are, they will be empathy-driven leaders. Some of the problems we have of corruption and all this is because some of our leaders have not even, like, to really go and see how other people, like, when you go to Zimbabwe, you'll, you'll, you'll just even, I was telling my friends that, do you know that the $20 you use in America probably to just have a drink? It's school fees of a kid in primary school to go to school for three months. So when we also expose them to this, they become empathy-driven leaders. They use what they have in a better way because they know others don't have that opportunity. Some of the problems we have as a continent is because the leaders are not empathy-driven. Yeah, yeah. We're talking to Shalene Chikomo. He's the CEO and founder of Deuce 
uh, a leadership initiative. We'll be talking about that when we come back. Welcome back. This is The Real Talk, and we're talking to Charlene Chikomo. Let's go to the founding of Do's Leadership yeah. Initiative. What yeah. inspired you to mm -hmm. do this, and at what age? Yeah, um, it's 17. It's 17. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so what inspired me, first of all, is my personal story, which I've already shared. Uh, the first thing was the realization that education is power to take the son of a peasant from a nobody and make him someone inspirational to the world. Seeing how education has changed my life made me believe that this is not just about me. It can be replicated to other children who might be down there. That's why when you look at um, JUICE, it is an abbreviation for two things. There's dynamic and limited commitment for education as the name of the organization. Then there's the theme, discover your diamonds, unleash your potential, commit to the journey, and elevate others. Why do we do that? We do that because to us, education is not going to school. It's educere and educare. Unleash the inner demons of the person and mold them. So we believe that education is that gift that can be given to young people to unlock the best that is inside of them. Whether you're from a poor family or a rich family, the prosperity of the person is what lies within. That is the most important thing that inspires me, seeing how education changed me and to be where I am today. It's not just about me. Sometimes, you know, we are uplifted to uplift others because you can't raise others if you are not raised anyway. So that was one. And the second thing was what we also talked about, understanding that for some reason, school is now becoming parallel to the expectations of the market. I wanted a shift from just certificates to skills, from just a job-seeking mindset to job-creation mindset, but also from just the knowledge of things to also the knowledge of others and how they can help you to achieve that. So we formed the Juice Leadership Initiative to specifically deal with three things. One, I was interested in high school students as they leave high school, that of less than 9% of young people that graduate from high school in Africa make it to university. Where do others go? Less than nine percent. Yes, mm. it's 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 that is that is that is that small. It's, it's not that much, and I'm like, where do others go? Which means high school is the last academic bus stop for many African for students. For many African students. Master Kad has a whole report on that, and I was like, these are the people we now condemn for taking drugs. These are the people we now saying teen pregnancy and all these things. These are the people. How about we create a program that actually help these young people from high school with better knowledge, skills, and the mindset to transform from high school to university, but also for those who can't, how can we help them to integrate in this ever confusing marketplace by a 3D curriculum, discovering themselves, developing themselves, and deployment. But I was like, no, what if we work with high school students and the teacher is not worked on? Because our teachers also, they see themselves as full beakers. You see, for example, this cup, if, if you fill it with water, that's how our teachers see themselves. And then the student is the one that is empty. Every day they so come the to pour. Uh, tomorrow pouring, tomorrow pouring. Why? Because it's all not just their problem. We have also a colonial system that we have to deal with, whereby in the colonial era, education was all about schooling, teach them. They don't know. What about what they carry inside of them? So we opened also another department called Education Revolution Group, where we sit down with teachers to say, as a teacher, you are not just a teacher by profession. You are in a partnership with the creator to discover, to develop, and to deploy the inner diamonds of the child. How is your class set up in a way that unleashes potential? Because there's no nation that grows above the potential of its, of people. its people. This country we are in, Rwanda, the country we love so much, when the whole world was running, it is the Rwandan people who saw themselves as a solution to their nation. The America you talk about today, it is the fathers of America, the fathers who had a dream. It is their potential. So if the teacher is not doing that, he is actually holding the weapons of mass destruction to economic development. But we're like, okay, what about the last thing, the university students? If you go to any university, is it University of Rwanda, is it LU, is it Carnegie Mellon, whatever you go to, you realize this. There are a lot of young people who are dreaming. There are a lot of young people with ideas. But you know what? A dream is never what makes a man great. The ability to interpret a dream makes you one. So what do we do? We go into the community and look at people who have achieved something. Let's take Jackie, for example, who is already a journalist. Mm -hmm. There is a kid at University of Rwanda who wants to be like you. Mm -hmm. How about we create every year, we select 35 at least visionaries from university, connect them with 35 at least 
achievers where JK actually has one student, at least one. They overshadow you on they shadow you on certain things. Yes. They do something you are doing. They, they see what me and they watch you. Mm -hmm. What do you do before a show? Is there a drink you drink that they can also drink? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Is it like, how do you do that? So that they learn practically. I actually learned more about this when I went to Nigeria. The Igbo people do that. So this is what the inspiration comes from, and this is what we are trying to do. And are you doing it? Because when you say it, you're saying it so well, yeah. and for a moment it sounds like it's just something on paper, mm -hmm. not yet implemented. Mm -hmm. Have you implemented this? Are you talking to those high school graduates that cannot go beyond high school mm -hmm. what sort of foundation are you giving them because as you've said again we're in an environment where education is that we view education yeah. as everything so how are you talking to that high school person and telling mm -hmm. them you can put it on hold for mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. this is what is inside you mm -hmm. what formula do you use to get it out of them so one of the things we did um, in 2017 when I started was something we call system change you know, changing education is not going to take activities. It is going to take a systematic change. And because I didn't have money, maybe that's how this came about. We realized the first thing we need is to go into, we started in Zimbabwe, because I came to Rwanda later, I will talk about that. We said, let's go to high schools, for example, and let's create clubs of the Juice Leadership Initiative. So when you go in Zimbabwe, I've seen some very amazing Rwandan uh, youth are doing the same. Organizations like PLP, Peace and Love, Proclaimers, I Debate, they have that model as well. We have that model. We create clubs within schools so that when students are done with their, with their, with their um, academics and so forth, they also have a place where they can learn about self-discovery, where they can learn about development, and where they can learn about deployment. Equally so, I do a lot of seminars on this, not to teach just people. I train, our theme is educate them to educate others. So what we do is we use peer circles, whereby you train six young people and empower them to go and train others so that it's self-generating and it's self-appreciating. So I teach Jackie today, you understand what we are talking about, I challenge you to go and teach five. Of those five, you challenge them to, you see how fast it is. So I've done that, we are doing that in Zimbabwe. In 2018, Nelson Mandela scholarship gave me a scholarship to come to LU, which I'm very grateful, and I came to Rwanda. For the past five years I've been here, I've been to almost every school you can think about. These universities, these high schools, that's why every week we do three. We do it, and we also do others not in class because we don't want to assume that everybody's in class. Mm -hmm. With the little resources we have, Jackie, we are really trying. And what we would want is for other people to not just ask us questions if we are trying, but actually to join us because this is something that will require everybody to be on board. But How are we supposed to join you? Like yeah. what, what can we do yeah. to make this better? Because I was going to say this, Africa's other challenge is we have a lot of good talkers. True. You have Shalene, <laughs> extremely eloquent. <laughs> addressing the seminars. The Shalines of this word. You understand? <laughs> and addressing seminars every week. Mm -hmm. You're eloquent and mm -hmm. you will give us good quotes. Mm -hmm. You will talk to us about Mandela, talk mm -hmm. to us about Thomas Sankara mm -hmm. and all these people, mm -hmm. and you will be invited to all these seminars, yeah. but then it ends there, mm -hmm. and you're putting on a very nice suit yeah. and appearing on all these platforms, mm -hmm. and that's it. Mm -hmm. So I want to know what is the measure that you have mm -hmm. of the impact mm -hmm. you've had mm -hmm. since you started work. Mm -hmm. Point me at mm -hmm. those actual mm -hmm. fruits of sure. your hard labor sure. and how the rest of us can help. Let yeah. me know. So first of all, the problem is not just we have speakers. People also need to know that we are differently gifted. And the speaker is not wrong to speak because he can. But the implementer is wrong to comment that the speaker is speaking and not, and, 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 and not implementing. <laughs> we want the speakers to implement, ah, You <laughs> see, so even if you look at any stable organization, everybody has their role. And if everybody can do their role so well, which is why I always tell young people, don't comment that, you know, Lumumba is only speaking about Africa. You have heard his speech and you think you can. Go and do what you think is necessary. So for us as the eloquent, our duty is to raise an awareness. But we are not saying that's the end we have achieved. No, we are saying maybe this awareness will lead to a generation that will come and implement what we are talking about. The fathers of Africa dreamt about Africa, but they didn't leave it as a united continent. It is the presidents of today who are doing regional integration. East Africa, but that was dreamt by Kwame Nkrumah somewhere, but they are inspired by that. So. What, how I measure my impact for me. Um, number one, we look at the people themselves. Since we started, what was our, our role? 
And who are some of the people that we have seen are, you know, transitioning from school into the market? Do we have real names? It's just that this is on TV. But if I could be given a time to submit, we have stories you of have people. Names. Of course, we That's have. We, we keep the names. What's the number? Uh, 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 of course. What number will you get? Are they, <laughs> That's are a lot. 300, 500? Uh, more than that. 3, more than that, definitely. This okay. has been five years of work. Okay. It's, it's more. And, and, and another thing we look at, we look at who are these people? Where are they really coming from? And where are they now? Right, number one. Number two, we look at the conversation. One of the things we committed to is we want to lead the conversation of reimagining education in Africa. And so far, because of our conversations and so forth, we have started, we have started people have started talking about this. Today we are on TV, we are also talking, raising that awareness. So don't also take that for granted because we always, uh, the more people dialogue, the more the light is but brought on issues. The story of the African education system uh -huh. is one that has been there for 30 years. No, no, no. no. It's, 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 don't look oh. at it that way. Okay. There are a lot of things that have changed. For example, it's not just about story. Okay, look at these institutions like LU, like Carnage Mellon, um, this, or I was at IPRC recently. Are you sure the conversation has been there for 30 years? But people are starting to take steps these days. It's not what it used to be. But sometimes it's not as fast, you know. The change just doesn't happen. Like we were colonized for more than 100, for about 100 years. And we are not yet 100 years of independence. Why are Africans impatient? Let's be patient with our actions. Every day we are moving towards it, right? We are beginning to have young people resigning from being critics of the situation to being stakeholders and actually doing the thing. That's why I'm not here just to talk because I'm a speaker. Mm. I'm running a foundation. I'm not alone. There are other people, young people, who also run these foundations. What they are waiting for is partners and all these people should also start putting their resources, you know, to these young people who are doing whatever we are doing. So for us, really, I see the, the, the changes in terms of the stories. I see the changes in terms of the numbers. I see the changes in the terms of the conversations we are leading. Okay. I see the impact in terms of the schools we are partnering with who are coming on board to do this. But how do we want to be supported? Okay. Starting with you, Jake, for example. I told you about Think 1035, which is a mentorship program. Some of you are, have made it in your, prof in your careers. Okay. How about you also come and become mentors? We are not always reaching out for money. We are reaching out for your time, for your expertise that can be transferred to somebody. We are also talking to partners. There are some partners, for example, MasterCard. For us, when we look at MasterCard, maybe let me say on TV so that they hear it. When we look at MasterCard, they are report perfect, and we agree with everything that they are talking about. But they also need now to start working with us, maybe when we need resources to support us and move on. And of course, governments, of course, we want to work with them. We are not that group of young people who said our government has failed this and this. No, they have not failed. That's why they have us to also help them in what they are doing. And we want to be on the board and do things with them. Okay. When you talk about the fact that you don't always need money, yeah. sometimes we have professionals mm -hmm. that would love to make a contribution, yeah. but maybe they hold back because indeed they assume that that person, that entrepreneur is looking for money. Mm -hmm. So what you've done is you've just um, reaffirmed. You've yeah. told us that we can make a contribution. It's not always about money. I could spare money. some of my time. Yeah. It could be one hour in a week yeah. and I will uh, yeah. cause a change. Or you can have a platform like, like this yeah. instead of just inviting the same, same, same people. There are yeah. new stories of the ghetto that needs to be heard, new yeah. good works that needs to be heard. Some of you have platforms these young people are looking for. They are not asking for platforms because they want followers. They just want to to get the people who can help them to solve the challenges affecting our communities. It's not always money. These young people have so much that they need. And you, you may not need to give them money or that. Give them your time. Mentor them. Some people also say, for example, there's this thing. When I was starting as a speaker, so I could be invited and I speak in a wrong way. Because I'm a 24-year-old. I'm growing. I'm not yet even 30. And all of a sudden, they start saying, that guy doesn't know how to speak. We are not going to give him platforms. We will not invite I'm him like, again. I'm like, was there a platform where we were taught one, how to speak? Never. Two, am I not a young person who is still growing? So the moment also as a community we understand that these young people will make a lot of mistakes. They will not look how we want them to look. That's how what growth does. These leaders we respect today, if we go back to when they were young, probably they were not this perfect. So that's growth, you know. Let's be a community that appreciates entrepreneurship. No wonder why our entrepreneurs sometimes go to other countries. Because their own, don't respect, respect entrepreneurship. Never shun a young person with an idea. Because every country, every nice car you love, every stable relationship you love, started as an started idea. Started as an idea. And the moment we respect ideas as a society, we are bound to do bigger things. What did you say about the youth that feel like they are not moving because they don't have money? 
because there are some that will sit and say, uh, I'm not going to start anything because there's no one who's come to give me financial support. True. Two things. Number one, never complain about what you don't have. Complain about the lack of a skill to acquire what you don't have. You see, for example, I was born in a poor family that could not have afforded sending me to African Leadership University, forget African Leadership, even some village university somewhere. Your family could never have afforded to send you? No. Me. If I can be honest, I would have not even gone to primary school. But what do you do? There is something called reaching out. You know, because what you lack is a knowledge. Because, just, just say this, Jake, let me just say this. You see, for example, if you are looking for a girlfriend to date, or money to start a business or anything, it is not in heaven. It is here on earth. So in, on earth, there are two kinds of people. Ones who, have, who are looking for something and others who have it. Who have that thing. Who have that thing. Mm -hmm. For example, let's say you want to communicate to the whole country and you have good ideas. Rwanda TV has the platform. You have the idea. Mm -hmm. What does it take? Have you gone there to say, guys, this is what I have. What do you think about it? You have never done it. You are just seated there. They don't like you. You're just talking. Sometimes we even invite people and they don't show up. They don't show up. Yeah. You know? So first thing that me have learned in life, it's never about what you don't have. Always acquire knowledge to look for it. Money is somewhere. People are pitching. And I saw Anga pitch first year in Rwanda. A person pitching for seven minutes and walking away with $50,000. Other people are just clapping. Are just clapping. Reach out. It is away. It is in another person. So develop the art of networking. Develop the art of reaching out. Never complain about what you don't have. And then the second thing is money is one of the things required to run a business. It is not everything. Trust me. When I started Juice Leadership Initiative, for example, I didn't even have a dollar in my pocket. What it took me to do is to write a business plan and go to schools that had resources, and we started implementing. Other people who invested in us saw our work that we have done. So don't sit down because you don't have something. Reach out. Number two, don't, 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 don't take money as everything. If you are doing that as an excuse. Actually, money is at, that's why you see if you go to Nyabugogo right now, who do you give your money? It's either the bus conductor or it's either somebody selling chapati. Why? Because when the product is there, money is attracted. Money doesn't come because you just need it. Never. It is actually called currency because it flows from one person to the other. And in, in science, I think they teach something. I don't like science, but there's one thing I learned, Jack. Osmosis, the movement of water from region of higher concentration to, to, to a lower concentration through a semi-permeable membrane. And then what is, the, what is the higher concentration and the lower? When you have an idea, Money also always moves to the one with an idea. That's why we go to Simba and leave our money there. We go to Kimirongo Market and leave our money there. We don't go to the house it of will, people complaining. It will complain. attract it. A product some, will attract the money. What do you have that can attract the money that you are looking for? You want $1 million, show me a $1 million problem that you're solving. Glad you're with us on The Real Talk. Uh, thank you so much for always sparing time. Please use the hashtag The Real Talk and leave a comment. If it's uh, something that uh, Chikomo has said you want to comment on, please do so. You can talk to either him or myself. We're coming to you from Mithos Boutique Hotel in Chiovo. <music> Shalene, our leaders are always blaming colonialists for mm -hmm. our problems. Mm -hmm. About 60 years since a majority of the African countries gained independence, mm -hmm. we still will have our presidents get onto that very public global platform and say, the reason why people are not wearing shoes is because <laughs> you guys colonized us many yeah, years yeah, ago. Yeah. And so, and yet today we have a lot of young people that find this ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Why should our leaders continue to do this. So I wonder where you fall. Mm -hmm. Do you fall in the category that believes our problems stem from then and will always be there? Mm -hmm. Or do you feel like, no, it's time up. Our mm -hmm. leaders cannot continue using this as an excuse. Um, I, think, I think I'm in the middle. <laughs> I'm in the middle. Explain that. There's, 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 it's not fully wrong for our leaders to do what they're doing. It's also not wrong for young people to think it's time up. But this is, for me, this is how I look at it, right? There are three things that we should always know when we're talking about colonization. There is the colonizer, who is the person, and then there is the colonized, who is the, the other, the victim, and then there's colonialism, which is a system and a mentality. 
Now, for me, when I, when, when, I, when, I, when I look at this, I feel like even if you look at the colonization of Africa and how it started, it never started with the gun and takeover. It just started with religion. It went to education. Uh, in Zimbabwe, we say the gun followed the cross, which means there was religion, then the gun. We say the, the gun followed the pen, which means there was education and then colonization. But when our leaders fought, what they fought against was uh, the political colonization of the continent. The continent is still colonized somehow in terms of education, where we still have, for example, universities pumping a lot of graduates in a country they already know is suffering from highest of level of unemployment. Why? Because the reason that led to the colonization of Africa was the desire for cheap labor. And our curriculum is still providing a lot of labor, yet we are masters of our destiny. Something has to change. When, when you look at some of the things we still do at school, we want a person to be number one. Yet, colonialism did that to open a very narrow gate for black success and black excellency. It wanted to only award one person. That is why you see women can celebrate that when they are fighting and fighting and fighting, and then you give them a woman president. All of them are like, yes, is it going to change the status of women in the village? No. But because it's tokenism, it's the colonizer who invented that thing to appreciate one black person in a whole society and, 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 and leave it like that. So, one of the things we need to understand is that let us never take colonization as something that happened 60 years ago. Let's take it as colonialism, a mindset. That's like a demon. There's no demon that operates without a person. So colonialism is that. So it's, and it's still here with us today? It's still That's here with right us. It didn't still, live. We, we might be carrying it and colonizing ourselves. So whether old or young, let us not look at colonization as a day. Let's look at colonization as a mindset and a system and then say to ourselves, what is it that we can do to deal with it? In some, it will take education in the introduction of decolonized curriculums that allow black excellence to thrive. To some in politics, it will take putting in place policies that shows that we are a nation that follows our choices, not mimicking other systems. Uh, to some who are non-governmental organizations, it will take a new approach to investment. We are African, not African. Whoever wants to invest, don't give us clothes. Teach us how to make our own clothes. Don't give us things. Teachers, uh, uh, that will show that we are moving. So all of them are not wrong. The young people are not wrong to say, we are tired of you blaming this. Why? They are simply saying, we want to be responsible for the future of our nation. The elders are not wrong to say, these people have done that because there's part of colonialism that we are seeing today. What we need is unity of the old and the young and take the continent forward. You know, before people used to go to school for the stamp of approval and they start marketing themselves because of I went to Harvard. I graduated from LAU, you all. Uh, let me speak now, and everybody. Harvard, Oxford, you know, it used to be like that. But I think slowly but surely, the world is beginning to change and start focusing on what is it that you actually deliver as a person. Other than graduating from that Exactly. University. I actually had a conversation with my friend last week when we were just talking about how our education is like, it's like a bourgeoisie education where you are educated to be somewhere up, different from your people, so that you become an elitist and you start thinking you know everything. That's not true. But I feel like, trust me, the world is changing. Changing to start looking at the stamp of approval of a person in the 21st going forward shall not be the university you went to. It shall be what is it that you deliver? What are the challenges that you are solving? And how are you uplifting societies? The world is shifting from those elitist you know, societies to actually something that is diversifying knowledge, diversifying knowledge um, distributing it to everybody, but also respecting somebody because of that which they do, not just the degree. Welcome back. This is The Real Talk. We're coming to you from Mythos Boutique in Kiev. You should visit Atmosphere Restaurant, but also visit mythos.rw and see what they have to offer. Six Qs. Ashleen, <laughs> what is your greatest lesson in life? The greatest lesson is the world does not happen to you or for you. It happens from you or through you. So what I mean by that is most of the time people expect things to be done for them but it's actually us to take it out there. And we take it out there, we attract who we are. That's lovely. Do you consider yourself successful? If you take success as this, unleashing one's potential and not achieving certain things, I do. Mm. Yeah, I do because I've always, I think success is subjective. Some people say I said I'm successful because they have money. Some people say I'm successful because I'm healthy. Some people say I'm successful because I'm going to school. 
But for me, I say I'm successful because, because every day, exactly, I've unleashed what I care. And if that is the definition of success, yeah. I would yeah. like to say I'm you successful. Are it. What's your take on the statement, the youth are tomorrow's leaders? It's a half-baked statement. Uh, there is no a leader of tomorrow who is not a leader of today. Because when we go tomorrow, is simply a manifestation of who we are now. So that statement, one, has been used by people who want to make young people hopeful that there's a future that belongs to them. But look at all the leaders you love today. They started that thing yesterday. So be it now. You are the leaders of today and go again tomorrow and still be the leaders. But now that you've been running the program for yeah. five years, yeah. what do you know today about the leadership initiative that you wish you had known five years ago when you were starting off? We don't go far as our dream. We go far as our team. When I started, I was self-centered. I wanted all power to me. I wanted all things to be done to me. I could not trust anybody to do anything if I had not checked it. So if I'm on stage, the only good presentation was the one I've done. The only good writing was the one I've done. The only good thing is the one that I've done. But as I grow, I'm realizing I limited myself. I could have done a lot of things if I could have believed in the power of a team. And it is today that I want to encourage even anybody who is thinking of starting something. It's strength, it's success shall not just be a report card of what you think, but the team that you have. Mm -hmm. Believe in other people. No nation, no school, no organization, no nothing is built by one person. And what's your mantra in life? There are two. Okay, give us both. Loss of a battle does not signal the end of the war. Keep your guns blessing until you win the war. For failure is not final, but a step towards success. And then, and then, and then, and then the second one is educate them to educate others. And then some people say that the girl-child empowerment um, drive is threatening the boy-child. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with that? Uh, that? That question is difficult for me to say agree or disagree. But let me be, give something there. I, I actually feel like now that I've gone to, for example, African Leadership University, and I've been in the same class with some of the most amazing young girls that I see doing great things in this country and all over the world, it made me change my mindset about women. Before when I was in the village, for sure I would be intimidated to see my sister doing something because it was cultural. But sharing spaces in the class and outside the class with women who have not only been better than me, but taught me a lot of things, I feel like empowerment of women only threatens a man who is not educated, which is why women should not have an only woman master class and think that the boy already knows. He has to be educated because education is power, not just to change the life of a boy, but for him to realize that everybody is an equal partner in the process of development. But you can't tell that to a man who is not educated because in himself, he has a deficit. And he, he always sees self-esteem as something that comes from being better than others, not from going together. So let me just say I agree if the boy is not educated. For sure it threatens because they don't know themselves. They just think they have to be better because they are boys. But when you've gone to schools, some of us have gone to schools or have been, you don't need to go to school even to be educated. Master classes or any other place you would know, you are not intimidated by the empowerment of women. You actually love it because it makes us reach development quicker. Amazing. Thank you so much, uh, Shalene. As we conclude, if someone is inspired to join you, they want to join your army of inspired people, educated and willing to educate others, where do they find this leadership initiative? So they can go on, uh, on, uh, on, 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 on Instagram, uh, Juice Leadership Initiative, uh, or can come to my own account, which is Charlene Prazen Chikomo. They can go on Facebook again and find Juice Leadership Initiative, uh, and there is also my account there, Charlene Prazen Chikomo, LinkedIn Charlene Prazen Chikomo. So all social media accounts, they can reach out to me, or um, they come to you and you will tell them and where I, to and find. And I will send them to you. <laughs> and that, the reason I ask for that is because for me, what I have the inspiration I've gotten from Shanine is that. We all have a contribution that we can make, however small. Unfortunately for a lot of us, we look at it as small. Yeah. But what you consider small as an individual could be a whole world to another sure, person. Sure. So just go out there, and it might not be just leadership initiative. Yeah. Find somewhere, mm -hmm. find something, find an organization that you can contribute to. Sure. Thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Thank you very much for having me, and uh, I really appreciate this opportunity. I've oh, always pleasure. wanted to be on <laughs> Wanda TV and glad yes. to see it happening through you. With good. And Thank keep you. up the good job. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much for watching The Real Talk. My name is Jackie Lumbasi. It has been a pleasure and I'm looking forward to seeing you next week. May God bless you.